scum. <laughs> Okay, so thank you for your faithful financial support, everyone. Um, you can um, support the church by sending a check to WVSM, care of John Frayne, and his address is on there. Or you can e-transfer to the treasurer, or some of you may be on pre-authorized giving. And the upcoming su Sunday service leadership on December 24th, we have an Edgewater service in person at 5 p.m. and Invermere service at 7 p.m., which will be online and in person, um, and Windermere at 9 p.m. And Greg, I think, is going to play the organ, so I might tag along. Uh, there's no service December 25th, and then January 1st uh, will be Brent. And the email will, uh, the link will be emailed to you for the Christmas Eve Zoom service. And I just want to bring to your attention the United Church Mission, Mission and Service Fund and the Anglican Church Primates World Relief and Development Fund. If you have any extra um, money this time of year that you could um, give towards these, these two organizations, that would be wonderful. And Brent is still having Fridays with Eckhart. Um, the last one will be this uh, Friday, December 23rd, but uh, you will not be meeting on December 30th. And then in the new year, the sessions will continue. And Richard Rohr's daily meditations are free email reflections sent every day of the year. And if you would like to sign up and receive these meditations, type into your browser, browser Richard Rohr's Daily Meditations. Okay, and now we're going to continue to read um, the 94 Calls to Action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and we'll read three of them today under the category of health. Call number 20. In order to address the jurisdictional disputes concerning Aboriginal people who do not reside on reserves, we call upon the federal government to recognize, respect, and address the distinct health needs of the Métis, Inuit, and off-reserve Aboriginal peoples. Call number 21. We call upon the federal government to provide sustainable funding for existing and new Aboriginal and healing centers to address the physical, mental, emotional and spiritual harms caused by residential schools and to ensure that the funding of healing centers in Nunavut and the Northwest Territories is a priority. Call number 22, we call upon those who can affect change within the Canadian healthcare system to recognize the value of the Aboriginal healing practices and use them in the treatment of Aboriginal patients in collaboration with Aboriginal healers and elders where requested by Aboriginal patients. And living in right relations, we acknowledge with deep gratitude that we are on the territory of the Shushwap and Tunaha nations and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and celebrate living in an intentional and thoughtful relationship with one another. Call to presence, let us have a moment to be still in our minds and present in the moment. And our opening hymn is Angels from the Realms of Glory. Shit. 
Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent. The first candle of Advent was lit for hope. The second Sunday candle of Advent was lit for peace. The third candle of Advent was lit for joy. Today we light the fourth Advent candle. It is for, to represent love. It is recorded that Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. It is also recorded that he said, the kingdom of God is among you and within you. He also said that we are to love God and our neighbors as ourselves. Paul said the whole Christian life can be summed up as love. So we go on a journey of learning to love, of what love is, of where love comes from, and what true and healthy love is. We do this in a world where love is used for a variety of experiences. Some say true love comes from within. It is not dependent on what is happening on the outside. Love is a state of being. We can never lose it, and it cannot leave us. Love is not selective. It's not exclusive. Love is what we experience when we are connected to a sacred source within. Let us light our fourth Advent candle to represent the steepest form of love. <coughs> Let us pray together. God, thank you that love is a part of who we are in you. May we be blessed by knowing love as a state of being. And may the world be blessed by the love that naturally comes forth from us. Amen. Joy is a song that welcomes us. Once upon a time, there was a young woman, a very young woman, and her name was Mary. And one night, this Mary was visited by an energy filled with light, shining an angel, and the angel said, Do not be afraid, Mary, for there is life growing in your womb. And your belly is going to swell like the golden moon. And you, my darling, you are going to give birth to a baby boy. And he will be so filled with God like all children are, and even more, filled with God from the tips of his toes to the tip of his nose. So do not be afraid, Mary. And Mary, even though her heart beat fast, a galloping horse inside her chest, said to the angel, yes. Mary had a feeling about this baby, a feeling just like your mama had when she was pregnant with you. She had a feeling in her soul. She had a feeling that this baby, he was going to be someone. He was going to change things. He was going to hold the hands of the lonely and feed the hungry and give voice to the silent and weep with those who wept. 
He was going to show the world that everything is holy. Sing soul, said Mary to herself. Sing a song about this baby. So this was my mom's favorite uh, Christmas hymn. So we just asked if we could play it today or sometime over the Christmas season, and it seemed to fit the service for today. So. <laughs> So I think now we usually have a little visit from Benny the bear. And uh, are you going to come talk to me? <laughs> I think so, but I don't know. Like, I know you're really good friends with Brent. Yeah, I'm his bear friend. I just kind of like brought my bear spray oh, just in oh, case. So that scares me. <laughs> Don't need to be scared Don't of me. Need you? No. Okay. Okay. So you're friendly with Brent and everybody. Like, everybody. And oh. especially if they're good singers. You're a good singer. Oh gosh, thank you so much. Yeah. That's really nice to sing that song. I remember my mom playing the piano and singing that. It was so Aww, nice. It's just one of my nice, nice memories of her. Yeah. I, it seems like people have lots of nice Christmas memories. Yeah, that's like, for yeah, that's for sure. It's so nice to yeah. have those traditions. Yeah, we don't have a lot of Christmas traditions in bears because no, we I, just sleep through Christmas. Just, <laughs> yeah. So that's why I like meeting people here. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, that sounds pretty relaxing. I could use a little more sleeping too. Yeah. Well, you need to look after yourself. You yeah. know, if you don't look after yourself, sometimes you get sick. Yeah. 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 Like Brent, I sure but hope he's feeling better. I soon. know. I agree. Yeah. But, well, and lots of people have had it. And so you people just have to keep living with it, I guess, eh? Yeah, yeah. yeah, we have to just uh, do our best to mask up and stay healthy. Yeah, well, Christmas is a great time. Do you have any, like sometimes Brent has stories. Do you have any Christmas stories you might share? <laughs> well, I do. I actually wrote um, a story, like a little later on, I'm going to read something that Brent asked me to read by Marcus uh -huh. Borg, and he's going to be talking about Christmas and early Christian testimony and kind of like the transformation of individuals and the world. It's kind of complicated. Sounds like it. Yeah, but you know how Brent is, you know, like. It's complicated. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. you know. But anyway, I had a couple of days to think about it. And I remember that I had written this story about my granddaughter, Ingrid, recently. Her birthday was December 8th. And it's, when I reread it, I, you know, I thought maybe it's a little bit about my family, story and testimony and transformation and light in the darkness and love so then i thought well maybe it'd be nice to read to all of you would that be okay benny hey, please do okay cool yeah. all right okay. well i guess i'll just go back up to the front okay. so people can see me but yeah it's been so nice to visit with you and i'm just going to give you a little pat now that i'm not oh thank you anymore thank you okay bye benny. merry christmas merry christmas December 8th, 2022. Today is my granddaughter Ingrid's fourth birthday and I'm going to have cake with her and her family. Ingrid lives with her parents, Kathleen and Scott and little brother Frederick Victor. Freddie is a good natured little fellow, although his dad tells me that he is being two these days and says no more than yes. Even when he is given a choice between two things, he'll say no to both. Ingrid is a darling girl, and I feel so lucky to be her grandma, or grandma like G-R-A-M-M-A, -M -M as I like to be called. Originally, I chose grandma to distinguish, distinguish, <laughs> distinguish myself from Ingrid's great-grandma, Marion. A small thing, perhaps, but Gigi Marion had a big personality, so I felt it was necessary when Ingrid was born. Now that Ingrid and I have our own special relationship, though, I don't think it matters anymore. My mom died a few weeks ago, and the family gathering tonight has brought up some feelings for me, a mixture of excitement, sadness, and relief. For years, I have felt responsible for my mom's emotional happiness. My sister has been estranged from our mother since dad died in 2006. And my brother keeps his distance living in Colorado and traveling for his career. No one asked me to look after my mom. It just seemed that no one else had the time, the inclination, or maybe the capacity to do it. Our mother was a complex person, and there were times when my brother, sister, and I felt that she not only crossed boundaries, but hurt us deeply and even scared us. She suffered so much when family members shut her out but she had a hard time taking responsibility, communicating, and making amends for her part in any given situation. She held grudges and blamed others, but over the years I also noticed that her high expectations caused her to be hardest on herself. Tonight at Ingrid's party, I will also see my ex-husband Gord and his wife Sheila, who I've become fond of over the years. Even so, at times I still feel a sense of loss and hurt when I am around them. The shock of our marriage breakup was perhaps the greatest loss in my life. I've gotten used to sharing our sons over the years, <clears throat> but it has been an extra layer of loss all over again, having to share our grandchildren too. Gord and I and Sheila have been told that we set the bar for great divorces back in the day. But that came as a sacrifice for me. I never wanted to see them again, let alone play nice. 
but I did so because it would have hurt my sons if I did not. The excitement and joy of Ingrid's birthday is mixed in with grieving the loss of my mother and her great-grandmother. I wonder what traits and genes have been passed along from Gigi Marion through me and my son to Ingrid. Time will tell, but for now, I have been trying to honor the family history and traditions by tidying up mom's Canmore condo so that family can visit one last time setting the table with a Christmas tablecloth that she hand sewed, displaying the golden paper mache angels that mom and her mother, my grandmother created, and stringing Christmas lights along the balcony railings. Well, that might've been more my tradition than hers. Mom's beautiful artwork adorns her condo everywhere we look, touch and feel. Navajo rugs, Quebec themed paintings, bright colors with splashes of red, not orange red, mind you, but her preferred deep red with blue hues. I sure am looking forward to seeing Ingrid tonight. She is a sweet girl with big blue eyes and long lashes, blonde hair that used to do its own thing and stick up all over the place when she was a baby, but now is long and straight. She loves to dance and recently told her dad that her favorite instrument is the flute, grandma's instrument. When I am with Ingrid, I feel buoyed up from her happy countenance. She talks a lot, and sometimes if I haven't been around her for a while, I have to put my Ingrid ears on so I can understand what she is saying. Her S's sound like F's, so swing might be fwing. <laughs> it takes grandma a while, but I eventually catch on. I recall going to the park with her once, the motorcycle park, which is far away, so she was in the stroller. Well, she talked to me the entire way there and back. I didn't catch everything, but it sure felt special that she had so much to say to me. Some other things that we like to do together are read books. She sometimes puts her head on my shoulder and snuggles up to me. And I play this game with her where we make believe travel to other places. She sits on my outstretched legs and I hold her hands while we zoom over to see cousin Isla in Kelowna Greg and his garden in Invermere and the beach, and all the way to Ontario to see Nana and Papa. Another thing that Ingrid has taught me to love is tofu. Her mom and dad lightly fry it in soy sauce, and it is yummy, hot or cold. I didn't know that I liked tofu until Ingrid shared her tofu with me. She is allergic to nuts, dairy, and eggs, so her resourceful parents are very creative about making sure that she gets enough nutrition. Ingrid goes to an allergist doctor who has developed a plan to help her body get used to small doses of the food she's allergic to. We are hoping that someday she will be able to eat anything she wants to safely. Oh yes, I want to tell you one more thing about Ingrid. She goes to a Montessori school. I did not know much about Montessori schools, but there is one in her neighborhood and Ingrid always seems excited about going. Recently, I was impressed that she chose to do some needlepoint at her school. That seems very advanced for a four-year-old to me. I know I said that was my last thing, but I just remembered that Ingrid loves gymnastics too and is very coordinated almost all the time. The one exception is when she fell off the teeter-totter at the playground and broke her arm. Which brings me to the most important thing to tell you about Ingrid. She chose to have a purple cast, and purple is her favorite color. And now we're going to sing Sheep Fast Asleep. Sleep there on a hill, grass for their bread. All is still, cold winter night. The frost appears. Shepherds keep watch by their fire. Cloth there are sound, far, far away. 
The Old Testament reading is Isaiah 7, verses 10 to 16. The message and context of this passage is quite different from how the writer of Matthew used it when he wrote his story of the birth of Jesus. The Isaiah passage talks about Ahaz, who was the king of the southern Jewish kingdom of Judah around the time of 734 BCE. He didn't want to trust God when his kingdom was under attack by two other kings and their forces. Instead, he wanted to appeal to the Asrian emperor for assistance. Since Ahaz refused assurance of divine assistance, he received a prophecy of doom. Before any young woman shall conceive and bear a son, and that child knows how to refuse evil and choose the good, that is, grows to maturity, Ahaz's own kingdom would lie devastated. God will in indeed be Emmanuel, that is God with him. But in judgment, not salvation. The prophecy of Isaiah says nothing whatsoever about a virginal conception. It speaks in Hebrew of an Alma, a virgin who's married, just a virgin just married, but not yet pregnant with her first child. Matthew, in any case, read the prophecy of Isaiah as one of hope rather than of despair and took its term virgin to apply not only to the prior state of the mother, but to continuing state even during and after conception. Clearly, he went seeking in the Old Testament for a text that could be interpreted as prophesying a virginal conception, even if such was never its original meaning. Isaiah 7. Again, the Lord spoke of Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep in Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to, to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The gospel reading is Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25. We see in this passage the writer of Matthew using the, the Isaiah 7 passage. The writers of the birth sto stories of Jesus were carefully trying to write a beautiful testimony of who they thought Jesus to be. If it is your tradition to stand for the reading of the gospel, please feel free to stand. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. May we hear sacred wisdom through these human texts. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Our next hymn is number 70, There's a Star in the East. <clears throat> So uh, this next part, <clears throat> the just want to put myself down here. So the Anglican Church of Canada and the United Church of Canada have a tradition of thinking and discerning through our theology and our study of God. Also, in twelve-step programs, there is a tradition of take what you like and leave the rest. And so I'm going to um, read a message from about Christmas from Mar Marcus Borg from two of his blogs on pathos.com from 2013 and 2014. Now, of course, that was almost 10 years ago. So some things have changed a little bit in our society since then. And um, so we'll just, I'll read it and I may um, stop and interject one or two things to think about as well. And I just invite you to take this message and, um, uh, allow it to speak to you in whatever way it does. There is a lot of silliness in the contemporary and now perennial and largely conservative complaint that there is a war on Christmas. Often cited as evidence is the common replacement of Merry Christmas with Happy Holidays and the use of Xmas instead of Christmas. The former is a recognition that Christmas has become more than a Christian holiday in increasingly pluralistic and secular Western societies. The latter should not bother Christians. X has been a Christian abbreviation for Christ from at least the third and, to, and fourth centuries. More seriously, today's lamentation about the war on Christmas misses the real war on Christmas. Its subversive and revolutionary meanings have been co-opted for many centuries by the Christian emphasis on sin and our need for a savior who will pay for our sins. More recently, it has been co-opted by commercialization. And I found a little example of this in my bathroom reading this morning. I'll just not say what company this is from, but Kind of interesting that these bags, their uh, slogan are the uh, Advent messages. They're just missing hope there. <laughs> I thought that was pretty subtle of them to put that in. I enjoyed seeing it, but wondered if they, you know, had given that. Anyway, makes you wonder. So to, be, to begin with the latter, for many people, including many Christians, Christmas and the weeks leading up to it, Advent for Christians, have become the most frantic and harried and busy time of year. Consider the two most common contemporary Christ 
Christmas customs, sending Christmas cards and buying Christmas gifts. So it was in my family, that's Marcus Borg's family, until about 15 years ago when my wife and I decided to cease sending cards and shopping for Christmas gifts. But until then, the weeks before Christmas were dominated by the need to get our Christmas cards sent, often with a Christmas letter, and to figure out what to purchase for those on our gift list. The decision to stop giving gifts was made easier by the fact that our children had become adults. If they had still been children, we would have continued buying gifts for them. And I just wanna also add in here that um, sometimes for women, it's quite a juggling act in terms of what society is saying to buy the presents and the gifts and make a beautiful Christmas for everybody. And then the church is saying, no, 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 don't do that. That's, that's really bad that you do that. You should, <laughs> it's becoming too commercial. So, and I'm not saying it's just women, but um, because I know my husband has been a single dad and obviously he did a lot of that but for the most part that's sort of been women's domain to make Christmas special and happy and especially in my household I don't remember my dad doing a whole heck of a lot so I just want to say that I like what Marcus Borg is saying here and I don't want to guilt trip women into one more thing that we're doing wrong or something so just wanted to add that in for consideration uh, so both of these customs, continues Marcus, are recent innov innovations. The first commercially produced Christmas cards appeared in 1873. So also buying Christmas gifts is a product of the late 1800s and took a while to become widespread. Until then, Christmas gifts were simple and largely homemade. Imagine for a moment the weeks before Christmas without the need to send cards and buy gifts. Perhaps the most glaring example of the co-optation of Christmas by commercial culture is Black Friday, which is now in, invaded Thanksgiving, people lining up to get bargains, even violence amongst shopper, shoppers. And consider for the most part, it is relatively poor people competing with each other, but all driven by the cultural convention and compulsion to buy Christmas gifts. And I did take pause at this as well. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's a, just a little bit of socioeconomic and racial prejudice in that particular um, comment. And uh, so something for us to think about um, in the United States, there have been uh, um, a large proportion of relatively poor people could be people of color. And so this could be taken the wrong way. So I just think that we need to consider that as well. So can, continuing with Marcus, to continue with the former, the co-optation of Advent and Christmas by Christianity itself. For many centuries, now almost a thousand years, the most common forms of Western Christianity have emphasized that Jesus's primary significance is that he died to pay for our sins. This notion affects the meaning of Christmas. Christmas is the birth of the one who will save us from our sins so that we can go to heaven. It results in a radical domestication and individualization of the story of Jesus and Christmas. Another problem with the message of Advent and Christmas is that they have virtually been swallowed up by the miraculous. The angel Gabriel comes to the Virgin Mary and tells her she will conceive without the involvement of a human father. Prophets foretell such a birth and even its location in Bethlehem, despite Mary and Joseph living in Nazareth. A special star moves with the precision of a global positioning device to lead wise men from the east to the place of Jesus's birth. Angels sing in the night sky to shepherds. These are the themes of Christmas cards, hymns, manger scenes, concerts, and pageants. To be candid, I, Marcus Borg, do not think that any of this happened. Of course, there is some historical memory in the stories. Jesus was born, he really lived, he was Jewish. His parents' names were Mary and Joseph. They lived in Nazareth, a very small peasant village, perhaps as small as a few hundred, 
But I do not think that there was an annunciation by an angel to Mary or a virginal conception or a special star or wise men from the East visiting the infant Jesus or angels filling the night with glory as they sang to shepherds. Yet I am not a debunker of these stories. I do not dismiss them as fables or fabrications or falsehoods. Many in the modern world do see the two options as it happened this way or it didn't. And if it didn't, then we are dealing with delusions and deceptions. A few years ago, a television special on these stories posed the question that way, are they fact or fable? I'm just gonna stop there again for, for my own little, put my own little um, spin on this at being 62 years of age. Um, and having gone to theological school, I've thought about this quite a bit. And for me, I think, um, some of the Christmas story I am completely fine with and don't have any problem with. I'm just like, I don't have, it doesn't have to be fact or fable for me. Some, some things are really dear to me. And I'm, I just think, yeah, that, who knows that maybe, maybe that happened. And there's other things that I'm kind of like, yeah, no, I, I don't know. That sounds kind of strange. I think I could let that go. And I just think it is um, an individual inside um, it's what you feel inside and it's okay for you to, as I said at the beginning, uh, uh, those of us in the Anglican church and the United church were invited and encouraged to think through these things for ourselves, not just listen to the stories, but to figure out what's our theology. What, how do we feel about things? So let's continue with uh, Marcus Borg's uh, thoughts and teaching. There is a third option. Namely, the Christmas stories with their miraculous elements were not intended to be factual in the sense of reporting what actually happened. Rather, they are early Christian testimony written roughly 100 years after Jesus' birth. They testify to the significance that Jesus had come to have in their lives and experience and thought. The stories are parabolic, metaphorical nar narratives that can be true without being factual. So I guess what I was saying is what, what is true for you without getting stuck on the factual? What do you feel in your heart? This time of year is an opportunity for us to really think about that. And uh, Marcus's message helps us to uh, pull that out. He was for them an imagery from the birth stories themselves, the light in the darkness, the new Moses who confronts a new Pharaoh, the fulfillment of ancient Israel's and humanity's hopes and yearnings, the way of return from exile, the spirit and word of God revealed and embodied in a human life. That is the testimony of the stories of Advent and Christmas to make their truth dependent upon the factuality of the miraculous as some Christians and some rejectors do is mistaken. It distorts what they are about. Advent and Christmas are about the biblical hope and way, the path to a new kind of world. They are about our rebirth and the world's rebirth. To those Christians who insist that the miraculous parts of the Christmas stories really happened, I gently and respectfully ask, what is lost by letting go of that? Maybe quite a bit for some of you, and that's okay. And is there is anything gained by thinking of these elements in the stories as affirmations of the significance of Jesus, that he and what happened through him is of God? Does the truth of Christmas depend upon the stories being miraculous, or is the truth of Christmas embedded in the deeper messages of stories, for me, the answer is clear. For me as a Christian, Jesus is light in the darkness, the path of liberation, the way of return, the word of God and spirit of God embodied in a human life. In him, we see God's passion for a different kind of world. It is about the transformation of individuals and about the transformation of the world. It is about the downfall of domination systems and the birth of a world of justice and peace. Imagine if Christians were once again to realize that Christmas, the birth of Jesus and the coming of the kingdom of God are pervasively subversive and revolutionary. Christmas and Jesus are about God's passion, God's dream, 
for awakened human beings and a different kind of world here below, here and now. That's what his coming and Christmas are all about. Amen. Our next hymn is What Child Is This? And I invite you to stand if you would like to. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Take away the hindrance of our sins and make us ready for the celebration of your birth, that we may receive you in joy and serve you always. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Gracious God, be with all who suffer any type of affliction in body, mind, or spirit. We include today Pat and Andrea Prefontaine, Pastor Brent, Lee Kotick, and those we name aloud or silently before you. David, Dennis. May you give the health sciences or health services personnel, from doctors to telephone answering workers, the skills needed to listen to their calls for help and respond with caring and patience. Give us also patience and understanding as we recognize health workers are working way beyond normal expectations due to the number of people requiring their expertise. Grant, O oh God, that your holy and life-giving spirit 
may move every human heart, that the barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear and hatred cease, and that with our divisions healed, we might live in justice and peace. Almighty God, be with all people affected or afflicted by war in our world, especially the people of Ukraine suffering under Russian aggression. Help guide both sides to respect each other and work towards a lasting peace as soon as possible. Encourage countries to send the needed aid to those citizens without heat, food, or water, and open the hearts of people to accept refugees. O Lord, our governor, your glory shines throughout the world. We commend our nation to your merciful care that we may live securely in peace and may be guided by your providence. Give all in authority the wisdom and strength to know your will and to do it. Help them remember that they are called to serve the people as lovers of truth and justice. Eternal Father, provide us with the wisdom and understanding to live in harmony in our local community. Open our minds to differences and cultures among people, including from where they originated, the first peoples on this land to the last ones who moved here this month. We are all equal in your sight. May we too see others as equals. Into your hands, O Lord, we command for all whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And our final hymn is number 71, Twas in the Moon of Wintertime. And I believe that this is Greg's dad's favorite hymn or one of his favorite hymns. So very glad that he's here with us today.
And just before the blessing and benediction, I just want to thank everybody that helped out today at the last minute and Lisa being here um, and Brian and Lola and Sally and everybody. So glad to see you here today. And Brent, we hope you're feeling better soon. So renewed by the vision of God's way and refreshed by the companionship of community, may we take up the call to live the dream of God. May we live the inclusive love of God. May we, get, may we, may we gift all with the peace of Christ and may we let the spirit birth joy, wisdom and gentleness through us and through the world to us. Amen. Swift. Up. 